But anyway, the subject I chose to speak on is taken from the book of Matthew. This is a series of lessons that I taught at the congregation in Hepburn Street Church of Christ in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. I taught several lessons dealing with attitudes needed towards divine things. And the purpose behind those lessons was to edify the young people, the teenagers, the older, younger adults, to understand how important divine things is, because many of our brethren in the body of Christ today are getting away from these things. And so it needs to be brought back to their attention. And that's why I chose this series of lessons. Now the lesson that we're going to study tonight is not dealing with that title, but it's dealing with render unto God the things that are God, and unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. And we need to understand that. This is taken from the book of Matthew. You see on here, Mark chapter 12, verse 1 through 17. But really, we're going to look at Matthew's chapter 22, because that's where I want us to go. And here's a quotation from Mark chapter 12, verse 17. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. And so we need to recognize this as members of the Lord's church. Sometimes it's backwards. Members rather render those things of the world or to the government or someone else still to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now I put Matthew's chapter 22 here and I wanted to break this chapter down. So I want us to notice some things mentioned in Matthew's chapter 22. The first 14 verses deals with the merits of the king's son. Jesus was teaching a lesson concerning the kingdom in those verses. And then in verse 15 through verse 22, he's talking about Caesar, the Caesar's test. And then in Matthew 22, verse 23 through 33, he's dealing with these Sadducees. They tried to entrap him, which they always tried to do. And then you have the Pharisees again trying to entrap Christ in verse 34 through 40. But the text that we want for tonight will be taken from verse 15 through 22. And so I'm going to read that tonight. So if you have your New Testament, let's turn to the book of Matthew, the chapter is number 22. And I'm going to start with verse number 15. Verse number 15. <clears throat> read it from the King James translation. Then when the Pharisees, <clears throat> Pharisees and took counsel, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Well, we know this is not the first time they tried to do this. They did this on many occasions. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither care thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar, or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? And if you read Matthew chapter 23, the next chapter, you'll find Christ calling them hypocrites about eight or more times in that chapter. He called them hypocrites, two-faced people. Not, you know, they're split divided, in other words. And he lets them know that in that 23rd chapter. Now let's look at verse 22. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Well, he said, run unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and run unto God the things that are God. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this lesson tonight, dealing with this subject. First of all, let's see what we learn from this text. Well, we learn several lessons from this text. Does God ask for the things of men that are Caesar's? No, God does not. He does not ask for the things that are Caesar's. He does not. Must not, we must not give to Caesar things that are God's. Turn them, I like what he wrote here concerning this. This is his statement. The image of Caesar, which is on the coin, we give to Caesar, the image of God, which is in the image of man, is to be given to God. So even he recognized that things belong to Caesar that belong to Caesar, but things that belong to God belong to God. Christ's point was there are legitimate responsibilities to the government, and if you'd like to take a little lengthy reading, you can read Romans chapter 13 and look at those first seven verses and see that we ought to do that. And you can look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 17 for another lengthy reading concerning our responsibility to the government. But people of other things that belong to God belong to God. Now, this is an Old Testament text that we're going to look at. This one is found in the book of Ecclesiastes. 
chapter 12, the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. And most of us in here have read this before, or heard it mentioned or sermons preached from the many lessons. But listen at what he says what the whole duty of man is in that 12th chapter and verse number 13. And I should say most of us probably can quote that quotation from this text. But look at verse 13, please. It says, let us hear the whole conclusion. That's what some translations say, but King James says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, that means show reverence for God and respect for God and keep his commandments. Look, if you're going to show reverence and fear or respect to God, you should be willing as Christians to obey his commands. That's the way to show that you have reverence and respect for God is by obeying his commandments. He said, for this is the whole duty of man. So in that one text, he tells us what the whole duty of man is. Now Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, this is another one of my favorite texts. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of God. Yeah, that's the one is that we should be concerned about. It's pleasing God. Yes, we owe the government things, yes, but we also need to render unto God the things that are God. And I'm going to mention several things that we need to be concerned about dealing with us rendering to God the things that belong to God. Let's notice what this lesson is all about. We want to notice some things here, and let's notice the first one I want to talk about. Our bodies belong to God. You ever thought about that? It does. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, we're made in the image of God. God made us. And therefore, we belong to God. Now, I like Acts 17 and verse number 24. Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. And notice what Paul says to those brethren at Athens. We see, when Paul was passing through the city of Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city given over to idolatry. Now, when he said that his spirit was stirred in him, that means that Paul was not going to pass up an opportunity to teach. He was aroused to anger or indignation when he saw this city given over to idolatry. Idolatry. History tells us that the city of Athens had about 30,000 idol gods or more. So people had a choice of what they wanted. But they were not worshiping the one true God that we read about in the Bible. So Paul's spirit was stirred in him when he seen this city given over to idolatry. So he spends the rest of this 17th chapter explaining who God is and that he did, you know, he's not made with man's hands. He don't need anything from man. But then notice the first thing we want to recognize here according to this lesson. Look at verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he gives to all life and breath in all things. Well, that lets us know something very important right there, that God made us. And so our bodies belong to him. And I know some of you are saying, what about 1 Corinthians chapter 6 where Paul said in that text that our bodies and life belong to the Lord? Yeah, he did say that in that text because they were using their bodies for the wrong reason for fornication. And Paul had to write them concerning this. Now notice, for instance, verse number 16 of this chapter. Because these brethren were trying to justify their fornication and committing sin with their body. They said, for instance, meat for the belly and the belly for meat. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now notice verse 16 of this chapter. Now verse 16 says, What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a holly, or that word joined there means cemented, like you put concrete and cemented, that to a holly in one is one body, to two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And some brethren just don't get it. They don't belong to themselves to do anything that they want to do. <coughs> That is sinful in the sight of God with their body. It belongs to God. Notice the next verse, please. For ye are bought. Bought with what? 
the precious blood of Christ, Christ giving his life, but you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your what? In your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I know what apostrophe S stands for, ownership. I have a truck outside, and no one has a right to go up there and drive my truck without asking me about it first, because that's Carwell's truck. We are God's children. We belong to God. Our body belongs to him. We can't just take our body and do anything we want to do with it. That will not please God. Notice our bodies are to be used for God's service, not to be just misabused and thrown away, but used for a purpose. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. Paul starts this chapter off by saying, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, or pleasing unto God, which is your reasonable service. The English Standard Version says spiritual worship. That's what that translation says, or some say it different. But the King James says reasonable service. And be not conformed, that is, don't be fashioned to this world or this age. That's why a lot of young people need to know what the Bible teaches about our bodies belonging to the Lord. Because they use their bodies sometimes for the wrong purpose. Here he lets us know we are not to be conformed to this world or be fashioned according to this world. But many of our teenagers today dress like the world when it comes to their attire. They speak like the world, they talk like the world, they behave like the world. And God don't want us doing that. He don't want them doing that. They're supposed to be serving the Lord. This text says, be not conformed to this age, but be ye changed or transformed how? by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove or test or discern what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So our bodies belong to God. What is the purpose of this lesson? Render unto God the things that are God, and render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. And we as Christians tonight need to make sure that we recognize that and that we understand that's what God will teach us to do. Look at chapter 6. Now chapter 6 of Romans chapter 6 and verse number 2. This is just another text, but notice what he says in this verse. Romans 6 and verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign. You know, stop letting sin rule you, in other words. Let not sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members, members of the body, in other words, as in instruments or, or instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments or weapons of righteousness unto God. So God's word makes it very plain, doesn't it? That our bodies belong to him. So, if our bodies belong to him, guess what? There are some things we need to recognize. We don't smoke. We don't drink. We don't fornicate. We don't do a lot of things with our body. We don't take drugs. Now, I'm not talking about if you're on medication, like I am and others in here may be. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about drugs that can abuse your body. Fornicating, like young people do today. Shacking up. Saying that it's all right for me to spend some time with this individual so I can get to know this individual in a sexual way. I don't have to be married to him. I can just do that. I just want to know what I'm getting. That's the wrong way to go about it. But that's the way the world speaks. Even our overheating, yes. I don't like writing that one, but I wrote it. <laughs> but sometimes we get too gluttonous and get too greedy. Now I'm going to show you what a gluttonous person is. If you ever want to know what a gluttonous person is, you ever seen these um, competitions where these fellas haul down these hot dogs, 50, 20, 30, 40 of them, stuffing themselves? They are gluttony themselves. They are stuffing themselves, and you, you never see on the camera what they do after they get through with it. They throw up everything they ate. Gluttony can cause us to sin if we're not careful. You till you're sick. That's what, I don't eat so many times. You be in you know, a rolling the hole in your belly, rolling. You ate too much. When you eat a good meal, you shouldn't be holding your belly, laying and rolling. You ought to be able to lay down and go to sleep with a full belly of food. I mean, I stuffed myself <laughs> too much, and now I'm hurting. Shouldn't be hurting. <laughs> but these are just some of the things. And then I gave some scriptures here so we can see that the Bible does teach this, 
Okay, that's on Proverbs 23 and verse number 21. Let's just see what it says. The Old Testament does condemn it, and we need to be careful as New Testament Christians that we don't overstuff ourselves to the point that we get sick or we harm our bodies because that's wrong in the sight of God. Verse 21 of this chapter says, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsily shall clothe a man with rags. But if they not like Deuteronomy 21 and 20, if you like to read that one. And then Matthew's uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 34. I would not have time to read all those because I want to keep moving on um, in the lesson. So you can write them down and look at those texts yourself. But they're just letting us know that we can't use our body for the wrong purpose. Why? Because we've been purchased with the precious blood of Christ. And we belong to him. We are his children. And we have to make sure that we do things according to the word of God or the way God wants things done. Let's notice something else here. Let's talk about our time. Does our time belong to God? Do we suppose to run unto man, the things of a man, and run unto God, the things of a God? Yes. Time is very important. Time is something that we waste sometimes too much. But God has commanded us to redeem the time. Use it wisely. Use it appropriately. Don't waste your time. A lot of the young people, as well as some of the older members in the body of Christ, spend too much time in recreation and don't spend any time in Bible study. Don't spend any time in coming to worship service. Don't spend any time coming to gospel meetings. There's nothing wrong with recreation because I like recreation too. I like shooting basketball, I like weightlifting, I like exercising. There's nothing wrong with that. But it never should come before God. That's when it becomes a sin. You're doing it too much when you're not even spending any time reading, studying the Bible, growing in his grace and knowledge. Something is wrong with that individual. And so we need to examine ourselves. Now that text came from Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 16. And I'll read what Paul wrote in that text. Ephesians chapter 5 and the verse is number 16. He says, redeeming the time. And really that word redeeming there means buying up or buying back. That's what it means. Redeeming the time. A time of opportunity because the days are evil. Make the best of the time that you have. Make the best of it. Don't waste it. Um, there's an old saying that I like about Michael Jackson. I heard in one of his songs, time waits for no one. And that's true when you think about it. It waits for no one. It's busy moving on. And so we should use it to the best of our ability. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17, brother. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. And notice what he says in that text. 1 Peter 1 17 says, and if you called on the Father who would not respect the person just according to every man's work, let us pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. That's telling us something as Christians. Now Psalm 90 is talking about we may live to be 70, may not. And if you take care of your body, you can live to be longer than 70. Now I'm not saying that you're guaranteed to live 90 or 70 or 80 years. But if we take care of ourselves, we can live a long time. But why has God commanded us to redeem the time? Life is uncertain. James 4 talks about our life is like a vapor. It's here and then it's gone. Just like steam, as you see, comes from a pot of boiling water. And then in Proverbs chapter 21 and 7, I like what Solomon wrote in that text. This is Proverbs chapter um, 21, 27, excuse me, 27. And look at the verse, please. Verse 27. And verse number 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. What a day may bring forth. Okay, boast on that. Dane tells us we ought to say if the Lord will. We do this or do that. And he was talking about business, of course, but we need to be responsible as Christians and not sound like we're boasting when we say we're going to do something next day. It should be if it's Lord's will we're able to do that. Job 14 said man is born of a woman a few days and then he's full of trouble. That's Job 14 verse 1 and 2. So our time belongs to God. Yes. There are 168 hours in a week if I count it right. <laughs> and so here's a question. How many of those 168 hours a week do I spend in Bible study? Now I want you to think about this because I like to make brother think. 
Now, when you come to the services here, I heard you come at 9.30 on Sunday morning, and you have a worship service at 11 o'clock. You'll probably leave if you have a good preacher, not a long-winded person. You'll probably be finished by 12. I'll uh, give it 12.30. Somebody like me might go 12.30. But that's not long, is it? And then, how many hours you come together on Wednesday? One hour. One hour on Wednesday. Think about that. Five, let's give it five hours. And then a, a worship every week to worship God. Now, what are you going to do with those other 160, 60 hours or 61 hours? Now, you've got to work 40 or more. Some of you work hard, like this brother here. <laughs> Coming in at 3 o'clock in the morning don't sound good to me. That's a lot of work. <laughs> some of you work those long hours. But the average person works at what? About 40, 48 hours, probably? Mm -hmm. Then you think about that. Then how about recreation? Well, you might spend a few hours in recreation. How many hours do you spend watching television? Then well, you might spend 30 something watching TV a week or more. Then let's think about how much time you have left. Now you think about it. How much of those 168 hours am I given to Bible study? And I want to encourage the young people here, especially these young boys, because they're the next steps to the Lord's church. I mean, they're the old, they're going to be the next generation. And they need to be able to keep the Lord's work going. I will advise those young men as well as the young ladies, pick some time out to read your Bible every day. Now, some brothers and some of these young people have so many activities that they don't read the Bible much. But I would encourage them, at least read the Bible 30 minutes a day. You're going to be, you'll be surprised what those 30 minutes a day will do for you as far as building you up and making you strong in the Lord. And if you can do more, do more. I like to spend about six hours in Bible study every day. I love studying the Bible. Love God's Word. Love reading and studying it. Hard to get me away from it once I get started in it. Now, I'm not saying everyone ought to be able to do that, but I just love reading the Bible. I love preparing my sermons. I love being ready to give an answer. I'm not saying everyone can be like me, but can't you at least spend one hour a day to read the Bible? And if you say, well, the Bible is too hard to read, the words are hard to pronounce, I know that because I have trouble pronouncing them. I have trouble pronouncing people's names. Yes. That's no excuse. You know they have tapes now, and you can go on the internet and punch in Bible video, or you can punch in Bible CD, and they're free, and you can sit there and let the person read for you. <laughs> and even when they read for me, I still struggle the names when I get to them. <laughs> have a little trouble with that. I think all preachers do, all Bible teachers do. But there's no excuse, brother. That's my point. There is no excuse not to spend some time in Bible study. You want to use your time wisely. While you're here, please the Lord. Let's notice some things about this. How, many, how much time in that 168 hours do I spend in prayer? Studying the word daily. Teaching the lost that I come in contact with. Do I make an effort to just do anything? Invite them to church? Ask them for a Bible study? How much time do we spend doing that? Being at all the church services when the doors are open? Growing as a Christian? Maturing? Getting strong in the Lord daily. This is something we all should do. Don't let your time get away. Don't waste it. Use it wisely. God gave it to us. Let us use it wisely. So we are living on God's time. We are. And as I said earlier, time waits for no one. And then I made this point here. How much of this do we spend in these things that I was talking about? We need to spend time doing that. Because God's word teaches us not to waste your time. And then let's talk about a little, our talents. It, I can see from what I've seen so far in the last day or so that you have some talented brethren in here that are able to keep this building, I mean, keep the work of this church going, keep it moving. And it's good to have brethren like that. I'm always praising brothers for doing things like that. But some are blessed with more talents than others. Is that right or wrong? Is it possible that a brother can have more talents than others? Two or three or more sometimes. Some brothers can leave songs better than other brothers can. And I'm glad God don't judge us on the way we sound when we sing. Because he'll give us a thing. <laughs> he'll probably be displeased. But he won't be able to do that. He's interested in your heart when you're singing those hymns. Coming from the heart is what God is pleased with. But some have many talents but don't use them. Now here in Matthew chapter 25, this is dealing with the one talent man that took his talent and buried it in the ground. He didn't do anything with it, just buried it. And I believe sometimes, brethren in the body of Christ, sometimes they just waste those beautiful talents that God has given to them, they waste them. Notice verse number 14, please. 
For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods, and said unto one, he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his <clears throat> several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made five other, didn't it? Five other talents. Likewise, he that had two, he gained two others. But he that received one went and digged in the earth, and hid his lord's money. After a long time, the lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five, and five talents came. And brought the other five, and saying, The Lord, Lord, thou delivered me unto five talents, and behold, I have gained beside them five talents. And so on we go. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. But let's talk about the one with the one talent. We know the two, the double two. But let's look at verse number um, 23, 24. Excuse me. Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew, I knew thee, that thou art hard man. Reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not brought. And I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast in thy hand. What does he say? His Lord said, his Lord answered and said unto him, Thy wicked and slowful. Now you got to keep that word in mind right there. Slowful. Thy wicked and slowful servant. Thou knew that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strong. Thou ought to therefore to have put or deposited my money to the exchange, and then my coming I should have received my own usually or interest. He did it. And so what happened to him? Well, verse 30 says, Cast ye the unprofitable servant into the out of darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, what's the point behind this? If you have a talent, you need to use that talent, don't waste it. And there are many who have many talents and sometimes don't use them. Whatever talent we have, we need to use to the best of our ability. Look at Romans chapter 12. Look at what he said about those brethren who had those different talents. <coughs> Romans chapter 12, and verse number 6. Let's just read it together. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> or 12, excuse me. And the verse is number 6. Chapter 12, verse 6. Listen to what he says. Having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Our ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Are he that teaches on teaching? Are he that exhorts on exhortation? He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And then he says, let love be without dissimulation. That is, let it be sincere. Let it be genuine. And part of that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. These brethren use whatever talents they had, they use them. And that's what God expects us to do. Use them. Because this will invoke God's approval. God will be pleased. Just like we read in Matthew 25, and verse 23. To fail to use those talents is wicked, slowful, unappropriate, I mean unprofitable. As we read in Matthew chapter 25, verse 26 through 30. God's wrath will be upon us, brethren, if we waste our talents. Look, some brethren are good at going visiting members. Some brethren are good at going visiting members at hospital, visiting their home. Some brethren are good at doing other things, doing the work of the church, doing things around the building. Some brethren are good at that. Not everybody can do those things. But whatever talent you have, is it, whether it's leading, singing, preaching, teaching the Bible class, do it the best you can because God is pleased. When you don't waste what he's blessed you to have. And many have those wonderful blessings. So what is your talent? Our talent? Singing? Visiting others? Preaching? Teaching? See, these are talents. Help, helping others? You know, some sisters in the church are good at going around helping other sisters or older sisters who can't get around the house good. Need someone to cook for them. Need someone to clean their house. Need someone to take care of them. Some sisters in the church are good at that. Others can't do it. Only those who bless with talent can do that to help those kind of people. But if you have it and you don't use it, you're wasting it. Encouraging others, prayer, yes. Some good at prayer. Some brothers say, thank you, Lord, for blessing. Amen. That's all they're going to do. And you have some that pray those long prayers, and they're beautiful prayers. 
Not everyone can do it. Why are you using your talent? Or you're bearing it? See, we need to render to God the things that are God and render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. Will we one day give an account to God for those talents? Yes, we will. We're going to give account to God for everything we've done in this life, whether it be good or bad. Second, for, uh, Second Corinthians 5.10. So we better use what we have. And that's a picture of that, a so-called picture of that one talent man bearing what he had instead of drawing interest on what he had. He didn't do that. And God wasn't pleased. How about our money? A lot of people don't like to talk about money. Well, our money belongs to God, too. The earth belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. But what are we doing with our money? Did we use it for the wrong purpose? With many Christians, this is not the case. They believe it's, it's okay to spend their money any way they want to spend it. I don't care if they spend it on cigarettes, drinking, porn, whatever it may be. They don't mind doing that. And they still say, I'm a child of God. No, you've got to use it correctly if you're going to please God. Because we are stewards over that which God has given us. And this can be given both to God and to Caesar. Because we pay, you know what? Now you read that? Did you see what I got there? Where it says Caesar is more aggressive by collecting his. <laughs> you skip IRS and see what happened. You'll know what I mean. <laughs> they are real aggressive. They will go into your checking account. They will go into your uh, checks that you make every week and get their money. Take what you got in your home and get their money. My God is not that greedy. <laughs> But God wants us to be cheerful givers, hilarious givers. How many of us in here love to give? I can't wait tomorrow to give. There ain't going to be too many hands for a visit. But how many of us doing? I know some of y'all. I know some of y'all happy tomorrow to give. But that's the way God wants us to do it. When you give tomorrow, you already made up your mind what you're going to give. And you are happy to give it. You don't do it with grudgingly, saying, Boy, I put that dollar in that shoe. You let me put, let me get 50 cents back. <laughs> I'm just talking, of course. <laughs> but we need to make sure we understand that. Let's notice some other things here about concerning this. Now let's notice, we as Christians are commanded to give, and we are told to do it on the first day of the week, or called the first Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And the New Testament is plain on giving. It doesn't make it hard. It's very simple and plain the way God has it written for us to know the Holy Spirit is beyond Upon the first day of the week, personal, that each one of you give is provided. Let him lay by in store. And it's also proportionate to you. As he prosper, that there be no gathering when I come. Prevent it. So think about that. That there be no collection when I come. And so God's word teaches us exactly how to give. Read from 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. And then let's notice also this. God love for cheerful giver. I just mentioned that. But let's read the text. <clears throat> let's read the text. Just to make sure we read it and that we've seen that God's word did say. You know, um, it's wrong for a preacher to get behind the podium. Like I've heard of some preachers in the Lord's church telling members, you need to give 10% or more. You need to give better than they did under the Old Testament. You should give 10% or more. He has no right to tell anyone what they should give. Giving is a personal thing between you and God. We do it the way Paul teaches us to do it right here in first, Second Corinthians chapter 9. Listen to what he says here. He says, every man according as he has purpose in his heart. That word purpose only found one time. The Greek word for this word is found only one time in the New Testament and it means decide. For every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, and I'll explain this here as we go on what that means. Our giving should be from a grateful heart. God wants givers who give from gladness of heart, as we've seen in verse 7. The word cheerful means joyful, glad, or happy. That's why I ask how many of us can't wait tomorrow to give. A generous giver is not one who feels forced by others or who is coerced, coerced to me but one who is willing to give from his heart. That's the way God wants to give. Because our money don't belong to us, we're just stewards of it, and we have to use it wisely. And this text here makes it very plain, doesn't it? It says cheerfully here in this text, that means happy, not reluctant, but happy givers. That's what God wants, because we belong to him. 
A generous giver is not one who feels forced by others or who is forced, but one who's willing to give. And I mentioned that last in my last PowerPoint, so that's got pulled over the next one. He does not give grudgingly out of grief, sorrow, pain, or regret. No, he doesn't do that. Like the little boy that had the um, two dimes that his daddy gave him, two dimes, told him, you put one dime in church and you take the other dime and spin it. Boy going down the road, flipping up one dime, oh, oh, yeah, da, 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 and then it went down in the drain. Oh, oh, that's lost, buddy. We don't need to be like that. We need to be givers that are not of grief and sorrow or pain. It's just pain you to give tomorrow. Because you already know purpose in your heart, what you going to give. You need to remember this. God don't really need our money at all. He has everything. But I tell you what I do, and the preacher do, and the congregation does, if it's going to keep the building cool and keep everybody comfortable and pay the light bill and other bills, yes. But when you give, don't give pressure. So he does not give out of necessity. What does necessity mean? That's under compulsion, constrained, or out of a sense of duty. I got to do this. And I'll, I'll tell you too, but I wouldn't mind telling you, I have sometimes caught myself saying, when I talk to other people, well, I can't go with you right now. I got to go to church Sunday morning. I got to go to Bible class Wednesday night. Now, I'm not trying to say when I say that, that I'm saying I'm forced to go. I better go. No. But some are like that when it comes to going to church service. You know, I got to go Sunday morning. I really don't want to go, but I got to go. Now, I can understand people saying, I don't want to go to work Monday morning. I can understand that. And you have a right to say that. But when it comes to the assembly, you don't have a right to say that. I got to go. I'm forced to go. But they forced us to go when we were youngsters. Then they forced you to go when you were young and you had no choice. My grand grandma said, either a beating or you go to church. Time to go to church. <laughs> I ain't want no beating with those squishes, those, those long, thin squishes. They take them, they dull them up and braid them up and hit you with those squishes. And they make that whipping noise and they pop it. I'd rather be at church service any day. <laughs> yes, sir, I do. <laughs> anyway, let's notice this here. Something else. We need to remember that we are only stewards <laughs> of the money God has blessed us with. That's what Paul said, we are stewards. And we have to be faithful stewards. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse number 1 and 2. Paul says this in his text. <clears throat> he says, Let a man <clears throat> so account us as of the servants of Christ, our ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. But then notice this. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That means trustworthy, faithful, dependable, understanding his duty and carrying out his duty. And we are only that, stewards over that which God has given us. Stewards are trustees, caretakers of that which belongs to another. Not wasting the goods, but using them appropriately. And that's what we need to do. And that's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, and Luke 16, verse 1. And then let's notice, we must one day give an account of our stewardship, one day to God. You know what the text says in Romans 14, 12? If you don't remember what it says, listen at it carefully. Romans chapter 14, verse number 12. I appreciate those turning to these texts because I feel they're not fanning. I feel they're turning, looking at these texts. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Yes, that's what we're going to do. We'll stand before God and give an account of the things we've done in this life. And then let's notice this. Our hearts belong to God. Yes, render to God the things that are God and unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. Yes, our heart belongs to God. We must love God with all of our heart, not some of it, not a teensy weensy bit, not a little bit, but all of it. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 22, in verse number 37, that we should do with our hearts. This text, he tells us right here, verse number um, 37, is that Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, that's understanding. And Luke went further and said, with all thy strength. That's our responsibility as Christians. That means loving God supremely, putting him before anything and everything in this world. 
in that text right there, Luke chapter 14, he said you can't love. You love God more than you love your parents. He said hate, but the word hate there in that text means love less. It doesn't mean to hate it. God don't want us hating our parents. Some kids will love that one, but he didn't say that you're going to hate them. He said you just love them less than you love me because I come first. That's simply what he's saying in that text. And then notice, we must obey him from the heart. Yes, we must obey God from the heart. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3 says, his commandments are not grievous, are burdensome. We can keep them if we want to. But if we love the Lord, we'd be willing to do that. We must worship him from the heart. Even our worship has to be done from the heart. John chapter 4 and verse 24 says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. From the heart and truth. It has to be right hard. Well, you just can't take the Lord's Supper and be thinking about the Panthers. Or think about, I hope I get out of here in time and he finished so I can get to the restaurant. You can't be thinking about that when you're taking the Lord's Supper. Your heart is not in the right place. You need to be concentrating on the death of Christ and the suffering he went through. And thinking about that when you take that bread that represents his body and drink that fruit of the vine that represents his blood. That's what we should be concentrating on. That's what it means by our hearts belonging to God. We are totally devoted to him. So we must worship him from the heart. And where our treasure is, there's your heart also. He said that in Matthew 6, 21. Proverbs 4, 23 and Proverbs 23, 7. So a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so that's one of the texts. Now put Matthew 15, verse 18 through 20, because Jesus said that fornication starts in the heart, hatred starts in the heart, fornication, idolatry, all that starts right here. But our hearts should belong to God. And so I hope that these points that we made in this lesson tonight were simple, plain, for the young people to understand that you need to render to God the things that are God and render to Caesar the things that are seen. And we need to always keep that in mind. So are you giving God what rightly belongs to him from the heart? Give God your heart and life and obedience to Christ today by obeying the gospel. You know, Paul gave his heart to the Lord. Listen to what he said in Philippians 1.20. He said, for me to live is Christ, and die is gain. Now listen to this. For me to live is Paul, and to die is gain. He didn't say that. He said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then in Galatians chapter 2, in verse number 20, if I didn't have them backwards, Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20 says this, because I always read Galatians 2, 20 with Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. And what did he say? For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And one time in the book of Acts, we can read of Acts, <coughs> Telling, um, using some straps and showing that whoever is going to be bound like this, if he goes to Jerusalem, that's what's going to happen to him. Paul said, why are you weeping for me? I'm not only ready to be bound for him, I'm ready to die for him. Now, how many members of the church can say that? Paul Hart was dedicated to God, dedicated to him. He loved the Lord, and he was willing to die. And he is no different from any one of us sitting in here tonight. No different. Paul was flesh and blood, just like us. He suffered, he had hardship, but he never gave up on God. And you don't either. So my question to you tonight is, are you a Christian? That he obeyed the New Testament plan of salvation? And I do this, I've been doing this here for the last year, doing this. So people sitting in the audience can't miss the plan of salvation. If you want to become a Christian tonight, you're going to have to hear God's word. You're going to have to be taught. Everyone in the book of Acts that was converted to Christ, every single one of them was taught. Every one of them was taught. You can't come to Christ without being taught. You have to hear God's word. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can't go, you're not going to be saved if you don't believe in Jesus because John 8, 24, I believe, it says, if, if you don't believe that I'm the Son, or you don't believe that I'm the Son of God, you're going to die in your sins. You're going to have to believe. Then you must be willing to repent of your sins. Make a confession tonight before men that Christ is the Son of God. 
and then be baptized in water for remission of sin. Let us start living right for, brother, for God, brethren. Let us understand there are some things that belong to the government, yes, but there are things that belong to God as well. We're going to stand now and sing the invitation song. <laughs>